Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. My name is Josh Ingeniero, and welcome to DevNet Create 2021. So today I'll be talking about Kubernetes and you, a short introduction to cloud native development using containers, Docker, and Kubernetes. Just a bit of more information about me. So I'm a TSS, a technical solution specialist with Cisco, part of the GV DevNet team. So as part of the team, we focus a lot on discovering customer requirements and really using those customer requirements and developing some sort of prototypes with a lot of Cisco solutions and Cisco applications to bridge the gap between customers' needs and whatever Cisco can offer. So I'm pretty interested in like security, automation, programmability, and containerization in general as well. Because we have a lot of prototypes, lots of use cases, containerization has really helped us um, create easier to run applications and easier to deploy as well for any of the different customers. So nowadays, there has been a huge explosive growth for interest in cloud. So a lot of these different companies, for them, modernizing infrastructure for today's disruptive marketplace means moving towards a more cloud native, native approach. Things that are built on microservices and deployed through container technologies such as Kubernetes and Docker. So every time you watch a movie or a show on Netflix, every time you click on a song on Spotify, or every time you try to add a card, something on Amazon. So these are all going through some sort of microservice infrastructure. So why microservices? What are the benefits of it? So for that, we have to go back to how these applications may have originally been developed, which is as a monolith. So monolithic applications are essentially just really big applications. So your features, the different parts, the different modules would be in one big core application. So for example, in the case of an online shopping application, maybe on Amazon perhaps, you would have your different modules with identity, with your catalog, with the basket and ordering, and so on and so on. Then these, this huge application would connect to say, the a web application or APIs. So things like verbal apps or for web browsers for us, we can access them and have our online shopping on the go, for example. Now this is all well and good. They do have a lot of distinct advantages, Mainly, they're easier to build and easy to test because of just the one core structure of the application. But even with those advantages, they do have some problems. So a lot of these successful apps nowadays did start off as monoliths. So, but as the, as, as the application continues to evolve, continues to change and improve on, it becomes a bit more complex because at some point, all of the added functionality, the added features might just be a bit too much. It may be harder to scale and in turn be harder to implement. So time to creating new features might be increased. There may be more delays introduced with running the application or deploying the application. So even putting the application across different servers, for instance, it may be harder to do with just a monolith because you have to deploy, for example, on the cloud, on-prem, all these different deployment options. So a lot of these different companies, Netflix, Amazon, Spotify, started with applications with a monolith perhaps. But how do we actually make it better? How do we actually move on and improve from this sort of software design? So how do these different companies actually leverage the cloud, public cloud, private cloud, and everything else in between? So how can we maximize this cloud and this biggest kind of hybrid environments essentially? So this we introduce microservices. So microservices, as you can see, we have the whole application itself, but it's decomposed into a lot of different microservices, a small set of isolated microservices, essentially. So each service right here is self-contained and encapsulates its own code, its own data, its own dependencies, essentially. So each will be deployed in, say, something like a container and managed by something such as a container orchestrator, something like Kubernetes. So teams can easily create and understand these different microservices and can easily add new features to them because teams would probably only work on specific microservices, identity, catalog, ordering. Since the application is decomposed into these different services, they don't necessarily have to think about the whole big application. Of course they usually do, but there's less prone to error and the whole application becomes a bit less complex because of the different microservices. Most importantly, this whole application takes advantage of the different benefits of cloud platforms and cloud native development in general, namely the scalability, because you can have microservices scattered across different developments or even more replicas, for instance, availability and also resiliency features, because something like a container orchestration 
would always make sure that there are a specific number of running microservices or running replicas, and will always ensure that specific replicas. So how can we take advantage of this? How do we actually start? That's where we bring in with the very basics of this service infrastructure, which is essentially containers and Docker. So what is actually containers and Docker? So containers are an easy way to package a microservice, for instance. So back in 2013, Docker actually paved the way for creating this sort of containerization instance. So the containers come from, you know, the shipping containers that or its different logistics companies would use to ship different packages in one easy accessible package. So your application will be inside these sorts of containers. Now this container would include, for example, um, a Docker image, which is essentially the application and execution environment on how you would actually want to run this specific application and also a standard set of instructions of what to do, what instructions to do, how do you actually deploy this in that specific environment. So as we can see right here. So these containers are actually isolated. They're easier to deploy in any environment and have a smaller footprint compared to, for example, if you were running it in a bare metal server or in a virtual mach machine, for instance. But with containers comes the need for orchestration because sure you would have your microservices, but how do you actually make things run together, run smoothly and run like your intended application in the grand scheme of things. So this is where we bring in Kubernetes and containers. So Kubernetes is essentially container orchestration. And how do we actually go about by orchestrating these different containers? So Kubernetes essentially you can think of it as employing a specific desired state management system. So you would have your desired state, which is in a deployment.yaml file, and Kubernetes would make sure that whatever is in that file would always be true and would always be running on the Kubernetes environment. Now, there are a couple of different components, but just to bring in the basics, we'll explain them right here. So in Kubernetes, you have the concept of essentially nodes. So you would have something like a master node, which would contain perhaps the Kubernetes cluster services in charge of communicating with the different nodes, how to actually run the different containers and how to actually um, manage the lifecycle with the containers. Then you would have your worker nodes right here, which is where the actual containers are running on. So let's take, for example, a deployment that looks like this. It's quite a simple deployment. It's just a basic web, web application. So in this deployment, I wanted to have three backends, three front ends, a service, a load balancer, and an ingress for this specific Kubernetes deployment. Now, I want this also to be distributed and have a replica set of three. So all of these will be deduplicated into three different um, containers or pods, essentially. So Kubernetes would take that information and really enforce that specific state. So as you can see here, we have our backends, we have our front ends, service load balancer and ingress will be inside. And they're all going to be duplicated three times because we have a three replica set, essentially. So Kubernetes will always enforce this specific state and you don't have to worry about it. So for example, what happens if one of the worker nodes actually goes down, for instance? Well, Kubernetes is smart enough to actually spin up more pods, more containers for the actual um, deployment to really enforce that specific deployment. So if this node goes down, for example, this will then go and migrate and spin up some new pods onto the different nodes that we have, the two remaining worker nodes. And if those nodes actually come back, then Kubernetes is smart enough to rebalance that sort of infrastructure so that it will perhaps spin up more nodes back into the original uh, worker on node, or it can move some of those resources back to the worker node essentially. So that's what we have right here. We have our applications, our different microservices contained in the different sort of small pods, which can contain one or more containers depending on the microservice, for instance. And then we have Kubernetes orchestrating everything in the grand scheme of things of how this application would actually start working. So with this, we bring about a small demonstration of how we can actually use Kubernetes in our environment in a simple microservice basic form of demonstration. So how we actually created this sort of demonstration is we have four main steps essentially. So the first step is essentially identifying the microservices, which is essentially breaking your application into the different microservices. So in this case, we have our backend, and we have a front end. So two basic microservices that we have for application. 
The second step is actually creating the microservice. So we have to de develop these different components. So in this case, I've actually created two applications in Flask in Python, and one of them will be acting as a backend, which the front end will be getting information from. And then the front end will be displaying that information in a neat little website, which you can actually see in the demonstration. Then you would have a third step, which is orchestrating your containers. So how does it, this application actually work? So which needs to connect to which uh, container and how does it actually um, go about for users to access your specific application? And then lastly is we have running your application. So then you can verify, test your application, see if everything's running, see if changes are actually being reflected in your application. So the simplest infrastructure for this actual demonstration is something like this. It's a simple backend serving information to the simple front end as well. Now this is in a GitHub repo, which we can share as well later on, but let's get started with the actual demo. So the demo actually looks like this. You would have your backend application, your backend microservice in a small Flask environment, which is connected to a backend service. Now in Kubernetes, it's pretty neat that instead of having to memorize all the IP addresses over different pods, different containers, we can use something that is akin to DNS. So instead of referring to this specific container so that you can connect to the backend, you just have to refer it with the service name essentially, in this case, backend service. So the front end application only has to access that specific service and it doesn't have to care about the IP address so this running container, for instance. Then we have our front end service, which is essentially a load balancer, which is balancing traffic between the th three replica sets we've established earlier. So I'm going to go ahead and go to the application code in Python. So in this specific deployment, we have the actual deployment.yaml file, which contains essentially the backbone of how this whole application is being orchestrated. So here we have a service, which is essentially exposing a specific container to the rest of the Kubernetes environment. So we called it backend service so that other applications, other containers can refer to that specific um, backend as just backend service and access the, the features of it as such. Then we have the actual backend deployment. Now this backend deployment is essentially um, a Docker image with the Python code necessary to run the backend application. So we have the specific backend, it's running with the backend service, it's running on this specific port and using this specific image. Very simple. We also have the front end service, in this case called second service, which is acting as a load balancer. And it is connecting to the front end via port, port 5001. And you can access the service from 6001. Now, this, is, this makes the environment essentially a bit safer because you're not allowed to access a service directly unless it is being allowed access to, would say, um, a service or a load balancer, for example. So if I try to go to 5001, it's just not going to let me. I have to access the application through 6001. Then we have the actual application right here. Again, a Python Flask server. And then a couple of different um, environments that we can use for testing. So I can go ahead and just do scaffold start. So in this environment, we're actually using scaffold, which makes it way easier to run and deploy Kubernetes deployments, because instead of typing in cube, kubelet commands, I can just go ahead and do scaffold run. And it will run all of this specific deployments for me. So it's going to connect to my Kubernetes environment, which is actually running on Docker desktop, because Docker desktop would have its own Kubernetes cluster that you can enable in the settings. So it's really convenient and really easy to develop with Kubernetes on just your laptop, for instance. So we can see here it's running, it's running the deployments and starting deployments. So if you go to your web browser, for example, and access localhost 6001, we can then have access to the actual front end of the microservice. So we have here basic microservice data received, hello from Kubernetes. Now, if we go to the actual code again, we can see that the root domain, the root URL of this specific front end is just accessing the root domain of the backend as well, getting the info tag as a JSON, and then pushing that specific information as data to the front end. So if we go to the backend application, we can see that the info is hello from Kubernetes. So we can actually change this. Say hello from DevNet create 2021. 
And if you run this deployment again, Scaffold would automatically build this specific deployment for us. So it will rebuild the image for the backend because we've changed the information for it, running it through the build script, collecting some images, collecting some modules for Python, essentially. So now we just have to wait for it to deploy. Now that it started deployment, we can actually go ahead and check if the front end actually changed as well. So if we hit refresh right here, we can see that it changed. It's now hello from DevNet Create 2021. So you can see here how simple it is to actually create your own microservice environment, how to actually code your own backend, code your own front end, and really make take advantage of Kubernetes and these different orchestration tools essentially. Because instead of you having to, for example, um, care about requirements. If you wanted to run this on a different computer, you have to install Python, install requirements, yada, yada, yada. You can just basically have your own Kubernetes cluster, say for example, in Docker desktop and run it on that. And then you would have the same experience as if the person running it on the original environment would have as well. So that's essentially the demo for our basic microservice application. So in this demo, we've actually used Docker desktop and running the Kubernetes engine um, as a Kubernetes cluster inside a Docker desktop. Then we use Scaffold to essentially run this deployment at YAML in a fast as way, um, in a way that's easier for us to run instead of memorizing a lot of different commits. So with that demonstration, just a couple of calls to action so that you can take a lot of these different information and then do some research, even make your own microservice Kubernetes environment and even use the specific report that we had right here. So you can get your hands on the actual microservice basic demo on my, in my repository right here. You can discover Docker and containers and know more about it in the Docker 101 tutorial on docker.com. You can even try out Kubernetes yourself with the own tutorial that they have as well on their own website. And again, exploring Cisco DevNet is always a really good thing. With lots of different use cases, lots of different prototypes that we have on offer, you wouldn't have really much of a problem learning about Kubernetes and containerization. So with that, thank you very much and hope you learned a lot about Kubernetes containers and have a good rest of your day.